Praise the Lord. Great to be together, everybody. Good to see you all. A couple of quick reminders for you before you jump in. If you've missed anything along the way, make sure you visit our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for HT Church and you will find our channel there. We also have an audio podcast. I like to mention that because uh, not everybody's aware of that, but you can find that through our website at htchurch.com and we're on Apple and Spotify and all of those good things. So Last time we were together, we went through Acts chapter 11 and 12, and we saw what happened after Peter was preaching in the house of Cornelius. And when Peter came back to Jerusalem, the Jewish believers were opposed to him eating with Gentiles. But once they heard Peter's explanation and saw how the Gentiles had receive the Holy Spirit, they also realized that God was doing something new, that God had extended also repentance to the Gentiles. After this, uh, Luke shows us how the people who fled Jerusalem because of persecution, how they started to travel all over the eastern Mediterranean there, but they were preaching only to Jews. That began to change when some of them came to Antioch in Syria and they started sharing Jesus directly to the Gentiles. Many of those folks became believers and now new uh, Gentile churches were forming for the first time. Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire and it was, uh, because of that, a very strategic place for the faith. So once the leaders of the church back in Jerusalem found out what was happening there, they send Barnabas up to Antioch to encourage the new believers. Barnabas uh, realizes there's an awful lot going on here, and so he goes on this little side quest, as we would say, goes up to Tarsus to find Saul and bring Saul back to Antioch to help. And then we talked about how the believers were called Christians for the first time there in Antioch. Luke then tells us how King Herod killed James, the brother of John. He also planned to execute Peter, but the Lord miraculously rescued Peter. And uh, the lesson we were drawing from that story there is that we need to pray without ceasing, especially in times of crisis. So um, that chapter closes by showing us how God ended up judging King Herod and how the word of God continued to spread. So the stage is now set for the gospel to go to the vast Gentile world. And from this point forward now, Acts is going to focus almost exclusively on the ministry of Saul or Paul. We're really at the halfway point in the book, and we're kind of at a halfway point uh, just about for uh, the idea of of the book and who uh, is going to be reached with the gospel. So tonight we're going to go through chapters 13 and 14. We're going to see how Barnabas and Saul and also John Mark with them went out on what has come to be called the first missionary journey. So they're going to travel from Antioch to the island of Cyprus, and then from there they're going to go up into the mainland of what is nowadays Turkey, uh, into the region of Galatia. So I'm going to begin reading in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Luke tells us, Now in the church that was at Antioch there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So here we see five men ministering in the church as prophets and teachers. A teacher, of course, is teaching people the principles of God's word, whereas a prophet is sharing more of what we might call direct revelations from the Holy Spirit. In other words, not a prepared message. It's a message given under the Spirit's inspiration. Uh, Later on, when Paul is writing to the Ephesians, he talks about what we sometimes call the fivefold ministries of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And those are not really gifts of the Spirit, but in actuality we can say they're gifts of Christ to his church because those gifts are, are not giftings, are anointings. Those gifts are actually people. And so with that calling to be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, comes the ability to function in certain ways as the Spirit 
empowers you. And so these men are functioning as prophets and teachers or maybe both. I would imagine that certainly Barnabas and Saul were functioning in, in both those ways. So we teach, about, um, we teach about those things in some length in our Life in the Spirit courses. And if you're interested, you can check that out and uh, find that on our YouTube. But these five men, the composition of these men there in the church has, has been an interesting subject to people who study church life. So first comes Barnabas, and we already know quite a bit about Barnabas if you've been working your way through Acts with us. Next comes someone about whom we don't really know anything uh, much is Simeon called Niger. So he has a Jewish first name, Simeon or Simon. But his name of Niger is thought to mean that he was an African with dark skin. Niger is the Latin word for black. So he's either a dark-skinned African man or sometimes Roman people did use that name for someone who just had a, a swarthy complexion or very dark uh, black hair. But most people think that he, like Lucius of Cyrene, uh, were African. So Cyrene is what is for us nowadays Libya. The fourth man is Menayan, which is the Greek version, actually, of the Hebrew name Menachem. So uh, even though he has a Greek name, he is perhaps also Jewish. And he was raised with King Herod, although we can't be completely sure what that means. But the, the word that's used there in the Greek means that they were, they were raised together. So sometimes um, in these palaces, if you were a spoiled prince, sometimes you had friends from outside just regular uh, people, commoners, who they would have grow up with you as friends so that you would have friends, you know, who were not royal to hang out with. So the idea is that whoever this Menayan is, uh, he's probably a Jewish man who was, who literally grew up from childhood as the friend of King Herod. And that being the case, he's probably uh, a fair amount older than the other men. And then finally, we have Saul of Tarsus. So this, I think you can see, is a, is a multicultural group. It's probably a multiracial, multi-ethnic group. And it's also a group of varying social backgrounds. So you have somebody who was raised in a palace. You also have Barnabas, who is a priest and wealthy. And you have Saul, who is a, a very learned Jewish man, but his trade was, was a tent maker. Paul is a, is a working class guy. And then you have these two African brothers. We're not sure of that background. But you can see that there is diverse leadership in the church. Many people see them as elders there. Although it's, it's possible that they weren't really governing, if you want to use that word. They weren't really governing the church. But they might have been some of the missionaries to Antioch who reached out to the Gentiles. The reason I say that is because you have to remember at this time in history... There are no large churches the way that we do church, right, in our culture. There's no church buildings like this. There were no church buildings at all until probably the, the middle of the third century. So the church at Antioch would not have looked like, say, our church and so we can't necessarily assume that these men are directing the affairs of the Antioch church as though it's one large congregation. But obviously they have some prominence because God has graced them to be prophets and to be teachers of God's word. In any case, uh, here they are spending their time uh, together as leaders worshiping the Lord. And I love that. That's awesome. They are ministering to the Lord, which means they're waiting in God's presence with worship. And they're also praying and fasting together. And Luke wants us to know that in one of these seasons of worship, the Holy Spirit spoke through one of them, most likely through prophecy, and the Holy Spirit told them to now set aside Barnabas and Saul for this work that he had called them to do. So from the way that that is phrased, I think we are supposed to infer that there has already been some discussion about going out on a missionary trip. In other words, the way that it's phrased there, there is something that's already been prepared, something that's already in the works. And what happens is that the leaders fast and pray again, which is great. How many of you know it's good to make big decisions in your life 
with fasting before and then fasting during and after. And the idea um, of the verb in Greek is that the church released them to go. And I like that. You know, we have to trust God. Sometimes we don't want to give up good people in the church when the Lord is calling them to do something. But sometimes we have to trust the Lord that they need to follow what God is telling them to do. And listen, if you were a church and you had Barnabas and Saul, you know, as part of your church leadership team, it would be tough to let Barnabas and Saul go. But they trusted God and sent them out. So we find out now what happens. And this is the uh, and we'll look at the map in a, in a moment because it'll help. But um, this is what happens on this trip. So picking it up in verse 4 of Acts 13. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. I love that. That's how it should work. Because not only was the team sent out by the church, but it was also obvious that they were sent out by the Holy Spirit. And that's ideal. They went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, not Salamis, but uh, Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John, that's John Mark, as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bargesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. So that would be the Roman governing official from the uh, of the island so uh, if he's a proconsul it probably means that things are very peaceful there's not a lot of military op occupation cyprus has been under roman control at this point for quite a long time it's not like being in judea where there's a lot of strife where there's zealots that don't want you there and so forth this man, Sergius Paulus, called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all unrighteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So Barnabas, Saul, and Mark, they're undertaking the first part of what we call the first missionary journey. Cyprus is the home of Barnabas, and so perhaps they already had uh, some kind of plan, some kind of itinerary in mind. Cyprus uh, had two main cities, one in the east and one in the west, and the team arrived in Salamis in the east and began to work its way towards the west. So let's, let's just take a map now of the first missionary journey, and I'm glad I remembered to do it in color this time because otherwise it would really be a mess. Um, so if you can follow uh, the, the legend on this map, the solid arrow is the outbound journey. You see that? And then the dotted line is the inbound journey. So on the way out, they are starting in Seleucia or Seleucia. Uh, Seleucia is Antioch's port. Antioch is, was kind of an oddball city because it was massive for this time of history. 500,000 people, but yet it was not a port. So it had the seaport, Seleucia, Seleucia, which was about 10 or so miles away. So from there, they sail out, follow that arrow to Salamis there on the west coast of Cyprus. And then they started working their way west towards Paphos, which is the other main city. After that, where they're going next is they're going to head up sailing across uh, that part of the Mediterranean and go into the region of Pisidia. And if you look up at the top left of the corner where it says Asia, so remember the Romans, this, is, this area of the world is Asia, uh, Asia Minor, uh, but it's obviously not Asia, right, on the other part of the world, other side of the world from this. But they head into Pisidia where there is another city 
called Antioch. So that gets a little confusing sometimes in the New Testament. So because of the, the king, the dictator from back in history, Antiochus Epiphanes, because of Antiochus, there are about 30 cities in this area that are called Antioch. Talk about wanting to leave your mark uh, on a place, imagine, uh, calling so many cities after your name. So it's easy to get confused. So usually in the Bible, or if we're talking about the Bible, we call this Antioch in Pisidia, or the Pisidian Antioch. So, so they went from Antioch to Antioch. And from there, they're going to continue moving through different cities in the region of Galatia. So they're going to head over to the east, back towards the right. You see Iconium, Lystra, Derby. You see those cities. That's where they're headed. The converts in this region, they are the people to whom Paul will, in just one or two years from now, Paul will write his letter to the Galatians. That's in your Bible. So those are the folks to whom he writes that letter. And then after that, they're going to work their way back the way they came and sail back to Antioch. So that's kind of the overview of what this voyage looks like. So let's talk about what happens there in Paphos on the western shore of Cyprus. So when they first arrive on Cyprus, it seems that what they'd been doing was preaching only to the Jews in synagogues of the Jews. And that will be Paul's pattern. Throughout the book of Acts, he's going to start there always. Uh, you see this reference in, in, the, um, in his letter to the Romans. There's that little phrase that he uses, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This was by God's design because the gospel really is a Jewish message. The message of salvation through Jesus Christ is a Jewish message. And so by right, uh, God is extending it first. He's offering it first to the Jewish people. And Paul also went to the synagogues first because in the synagogue, there is a ready-made audience. There is an audience prepared who already knows the word of God. Have you ever tried to share Jesus with somebody who knows nothing about God or the Bible or anything? Right? It's a little different than the conversation you can have with somebody who already knows a lot about Christianity. Right? So the gospel was good news for Israel, and so the apostles were bringing that message to them first, letting them know that their hope, that what they were waiting for as a people, had now been fulfilled in Jesus. And that's why they were going there first. In the synagogues, there would also be Many God-fearers, many God-fearing Greeks and Romans like we saw in Cornelius, right? Cornelius is someone who, he's not a Jew, but he fears God. He worships and prays to the God of Israel already. He just hasn't become a Jew himself. But now as the team works its way across the island, we have this fascinating encounter on the western side of the island, it's the kind of encounter that we often call a power encounter. And we have this showdown between Paul uh, being led and empowered by the Spirit and this sorcerer who is with the Roman official in charge of the island. So if, in case it's a little fuzzy, what, what the Greek is saying there is that he's with the proconsul. He is with the Roman official. And, you know, if you think about it, this has been common throughout history. It's common in Scripture. What do I mean? Human leaders and human governments have always had sorcerers and have always had occult practitioners helping them to govern, giving them advice, uh, seeking information or seeking to get power for them from the gods or the spirits or whatever, and in many cases, even controlling them through supernatural means. We see it in the Bible, right? We see it in Egypt, we see it in Babylon, and we still see it today. You would be very naive to think, right? You would be very naive not to realize that many governments throughout the world are using the occult, are reaching out to dark spiritual forces in order to get help, in order to get advice. So 
Just off the top of my head, I can think of one very famous U.S. president whose wife arranged his schedule every day based on astrology. Okay? Ronald Reagan met people, got on a plane, went where he went, and did whatever based on the timing that Nancy Reagan gave him through astrology. So this still happens in our world today all the time. Very interesting. We don't hear of any great evangelistic successes on Cyprus up to this point. Doesn't mean that there weren't any. But now you have a situation, very interesting, where this Roman official actually invites the apostles to come. He actually invites them to come. We don't know why. We don't know why he invited them. So Luke says he's an intelligent man. He's a thoughtful, inquisitive man is what it means. Did he maybe know Barnabas? Because Barnabas was from Cyprus. Had he heard something about the miracles that were being done down in Antioch and Syria? We don't know. But whatever the case might have been, notice what's happening. The sorcerer is trying to turn him away from the faith. And we always see these occult practitioners seeking to hinder the gospel. Uh, the gospel, obviously, is bad for their business. <laughs> it's bad for Satan, who is motivating them and empowering them. And, of course, the devil does not want to see the spread of the word of God. And so these occultic powers are obviously motivated to stop the spread of God's word. So, led by the Holy Spirit, Paul is pronouncing God's judgment against uh, Bar-Jesus or Elimas, and he is temporarily blinded. Uh, you notice that Paul is using some very strong and harsh language there. I don't recommend that you use that kind of language uh, to people when you're sharing Jesus with somebody at work or out on the street or whatever you do. Remember that this, uh, that this is someone in the person of Paul. This is someone who is at that moment, full of the Spirit, he's led of the Spirit, God is telling him to do this, and God is doing this, releasing judgment against this man for practicing the occult arts. So please don't go, when, you know, when you're at the coffee maker tomorrow morning at work, don't say, oh, you child of the devil, you know, uh, let me tell you it's time for you to listen to Jesus, you know, don't, don't play it like that, please. You know, the Bible says, he that wins souls is wise. So you always have to make, make a note of what the scenario is there uh, in the scripture. So, um, but this seals the deal for Sergius Paulus, and he believes. Luke tells us, very interesting the way that he phrases it. Luke says he is astonished at the teaching. But really what he means there is that he is amazed that the gospel is Listen, you got to get this. The gospel is more than a philosophy. Yes, it is a teaching. Yes, there is a body of truth that makes up the gospel, but it is also a message of power. Do you remember when Jesus is teaching in the gospels and it says that the people were amazed because what? Because his word was with power. Paul would later tell the Corinthians that the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It's a matter of power. So we've seen this all throughout Acts. The ability to do these things in the name of Jesus demonstrates, is a proof that Jesus actually is who they say he is. Because a dead man's name has no power. But the name of Jesus who is alive, who's been exalted by God to the highest place, if his name can do something for a person, then there's validity behind the message. Something else important happens here, and maybe you caught it. Luke begins to call Saul, Paul. And he's going to do so for the remainder of the book. So sometimes saying, oh, Paul changed his name. Uh, most likely that is not the case. Most likely this was Paul's Roman name. So it was not uncommon um, because they were always having business and social connections with Greeks, with Romans, right? It was not uncommon for Jewish people to also have a Greek name or have a Roman name that they would use in addition to their given first name. So 
Paul's first name really in, in Hebrew it would have been Shaul, like King Saul of Israel. Shaul means God heard. And he uses this apparently as his Roman name. And so uh, Paulus um, in Latin, it means small or little. And I like that because there's, there's, a little, there's a little something there, right? Paul was humble. Paul made himself to be small so that Christ could be great in him. So it's a good name for him. Plus, plus he was also, according to... Uh, According to what's come down to us from tradition, we only have one account of what he looked like. And Paul was, was they said he was, he was small. Uh, some people had said he was a little, you know, a little bit crooked, a little crook-backed. Maybe that's from all the rough treatment that he had. But they said he was small and balding and he had a hook nose. He was just a, a little guy, uh, full of intensity, full of passion, not a big man at all. So the name of Little might have actually uh, just suited him very well. So let's go on from there to the other Antioch, Antioch and Pisidia. And I'm going to go through this section quickly in the interest uh, of time. Uh, there's a lot of, in Paul's sermon that we're going to look at, there is um, uh, another laying out of some of Israel's history uh, that we don't really need to linger on too much. But there are some important things to notice in this section. One important thing is that John Mark leaves them. He leaves. We don't know why he left. Um, people have put out all kinds of theories as to why Mark just took off at this point. Some people say he just wasn't up for the travel. Uh, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of walking involved here. Um, I don't know if you can tell from the map, but to walk from one of these, from some of these cities, from one city to get to the next, uh, it's dozens of miles to go from one city to the next. Some people have suggested that the uh, that Mark was upset because all of a sudden Paul is becoming the prominent one. I love Barnabas' heart. Barnabas is the encourager, right? Uh, he ended up getting superseded, getting eclipsed, if you will, uh, by Paul. Barnabas started out as the senior guy. But right now we're in a transitionary phase where Paul is becoming uh, the more prominent person, right? Uh, ask any Christian. Uh, there's a hundred Christians who know about Paul today for every one that know about Barnabas. But once upon a time, that was not the case. Barnabas was famous. Barnabas was the guy. The leaders in Jerusalem are like, wow, look at all these Gentiles getting saved. This is a big deal. We better send Barnabas. But now it's shifting, and maybe Mark was bothered by that, that Barnabas was starting to kind of be the background guy, and Paul was the guy. It's also been suggested that John Mark got freaked out because, you know, you go on a missions trip and you're, you're serving this missionary and he's going around blinding people in the name of Jesus and you're like, I'm out, <laughs> right? So, um, you know, we, we just don't know. It's one of those things we'll find out in heaven, but you'll be too embarrassed to ask them, so you'll have to ask somebody on the side. But later on, Barnabas is going to want Mark to minister with them again and Paul is going to oppose that idea. Because from Paul's point of view, Mark has abandoned them. It's like, look, you signed up to come and help us. You know, we're old guys. You got to carry our luggage, whatever it is. And now he takes off. And that's going to be a source of friction between Barnabas and Paul. So the team is now sailing to the mainland. If you want to look at your map, you don't have to, but you can flip back to it if you need to. And they're going to head up into Antioch of Pisidia. Now, as you read Acts... Um, Always notice, and we've seen a few sermons already in Acts, always notice when you're reading the sermons, notice how they're set up. Paul's preaching is always going to be different depending on the context, depending on the audience. Doesn't mean that there's a different gospel, right? The message is always the same, but how I package it, how I present it depends on who's in the room, right? Makes sense. So, here, Paul's going to be preaching in a synagogue to an audience of people who already know the Bible. He's going to be giving them a ton of scripture. He's going to be presenting Jesus to them as the fulfillment of promises from God that they already know, all know about. And that is very different from how he's going to present Jesus to the pagans a little while after. But as often happens in Acts, uh, be alert for the fact that healings, miracles, signs, and wonders 
will always be creating opportunities for, some, for them to share Jesus. So let's take a look at this message uh, in Acts 13. And it's very important as a statement of Paul's belief. And you got to imagine this is the kind of message that Paul would bring in all of these towns that he went to when he would begin by speaking to Jewish people. This is the longest sermon in the book of Acts, except for Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. So verse 13 says, When Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. So we don't know why there isn't any record of the team preaching before they made it to Antioch. Usually what um, people suggest here is that Paul was sick and that Paul wanted to get inland and get up the mountains really fast where it was a lot cooler, where there was a more comfortable climate. Why do we say that? Well, we suspect that this is the case because when Paul writes his letter to the Galatians, which is in the neighborhood here, Paul mentions to them, and you may remember this from Galatians, he says, when I first preached to you, it was because of an illness. And he said, I I bear you witness that if you could have, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So Bible scholars believe that Paul's illness, whatever it might have been, affected their route, affected their travel route. So, And this scene in the synagogue, this kind of scene would have been common. If you were a visiting rabbi, um, you might have been given the courtesy by the leaders of the synagogue to to share a brief message, to share a devotional, as as we would say, right? And even to this day, uh, worship services um, in Jewish synagogues, they they still involve uh, reading from the Torah, reading from the prophets. There's a set cycle of readings that they do. And so they come in, and this would have been the same all over the Mediterranean world. So usually someone will get up and make a comment on the portion that has been read from that day. So they read the portion of scripture and then they see two men and they say, oh, brother, you want to come up and and share something to uh, encourage the people? Then, you know, Paul uh, doesn't miss an opportunity to do this, of course. Paul stood up motioning with his hand, uh, which is interesting because there's a few times in the book of Acts when, you know, Luke is so good on giving you details, right? He, we've said he has that keen, observant eye as a doctor. And so he sometimes mentions Paul making these motions. So you got a picture now Paul getting up and saying, right, he's doing this. So he just, it's, it's the recollection of somebody, you know, who has seen him do it. A lot of times, right? Motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt and with an uplifted arm he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years he put up with their ways in the wilderness and when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan he distributed their land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, but behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. So he's kind of pulling this thread along of these big events, big stages in Israel's history until he comes to Jesus. Probably more people knew about John the Baptist at this point than knew about Jesus. And so he focuses a little bit on John the Baptist's 
testimony concerning Jesus. So in verse 26, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they didn't know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your holy one to see corruption. We talked about that in Psalm 16. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses." Beware, therefore, lest what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. So, longest sermon that we have there besides Peter's. And there are several significant things here. So, I would suggest even that you go back and read this again. Notice that Paul, what he does, and he's doing what we've seen uh, others do, right? What we've seen Peter do, what we've seen Stephen do, give you the content, give you the facts concerning Jesus' suffering, how it was according to the prophets, his death and his resurrection. So we've seen certainly Peter lay these facts out, the essential facts of the gospel. Notice, however, there's a little wrinkle here. Paul doesn't call himself one of the eyewitnesses because he's not one of the 12. He didn't hang out like the 12 did with Jesus after Jesus' resurrection and so forth. Paul jumps directly from King David all the way to Jesus and he declares Jesus to be the hope of Israel. Now, this is what gets you into trouble if you're Paul. Very significantly, Paul also addresses his remarks to those who fear God. In other words, he is deliberately speaking to the Gentiles who are there, not just the Jews. He is including them, and he is purposely, intentionally letting them know that this message of salvation is being sent out to them also. In other words, in Paul's mind now, because the gospel is now going to Gentiles, Paul's like, I don't have two audiences I have one audience. They may not be the same in their outlook and background, but it's one word, it's one gospel for all of them. And then maybe most shockingly, uh, Paul is telling them that through Jesus they can have the forgiveness of sins, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles in attendance. And then he puts the cherry on top by saying that everyone who believes in Jesus, everyone, it's a big word, Everyone who believes in Jesus can be justified from everything by which they couldn't be justified by the law of Moses. And this, this has to be outrageous to many of them. Remember, you're dealing with people who feel that in order to even have really relationship with God, you first have to become a Jew. And then you might be eligible for something more than that. But Paul ends with a prophetic warning quoting the prophets to say that, look, God said that one day he was going to do a strange kind of a work and that you need to believe it. So what Paul has done here is deliver a message for all mankind, regardless of whether they're Jews or not. And certainly many of the Jewish people there and throughout the whole region will not appreciate uh, this message. So what happens? They end up getting expelled. Verse 42 <clears throat> 
So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, look what happens. The Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Why? Because this was what they had been waiting for. This is what they had been longing for. I can believe in God and God will accept me and I can stay in my culture. I can stay in my people, Italian, Greek, whatever I am, I don't have to become a Jew, I can be me, and now we can have an Italian church. That wasn't really a laugh line, but it came out like that. <laughs> so, All right. So the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes, so who are the proselytes? Remember, the proselytes are the people who were born Gentile but had converted, they had become Jews, they followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. In other words, they're encouraging them to go on in this new way of relating to God through Jesus Christ. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, and obviously they mean the Jews who are not believing, they don't mean all Jews, right? But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy, and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. So in context, that would have meant they were speaking evil about Jesus. Uh, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles, for so the Lord has commanded us. I have set you as a light to the Gentiles so that you should be for salvation to the ends of the earth. That's God's promise in the book of Isaiah to the Messiah and to the Messiah's people that we're not just to be a light to Israel alone, but we are to be a light to all the Gentiles. So Paul says, look, we, we did our job. Our job before God in good conscience is to deliver this word to you first because rightfully it belongs to you because you're of the family of God. You're of the family of Israel. But now that you're rejecting it, fine. We're, you know, the people that that are Jews that believe us, that's great. We're going to keep working with them. And now we're going to focus our efforts on the Gentiles. Now, when, verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. And the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the region. But the Jews stirred up the devout and prominent women and the chief men of the city raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So, so this is a combination, right, of wealthy people, um, of Jewish people, and of Gentile people and rulers. So saying these, these guys are making a lot of trouble. They're stirring up trouble. They're disturbing our religious assembly, whatever it is. And they expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium. So they just... In other words, we would say they just kept moving. They just kept moving on. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. So this shows us again, this is Luke giving you an example of how there was a ready-made audience for the gospel. Why did Christianity spread so rapidly across the Mediterranean world in the first couple of hundred years? Part of the reason was because it had a big audience that was ready for it. You had all these Gentiles who were already had some understanding about the God of Israel and they were primed and ready for this. So they were very glad to hear, as we've said a number of times, that they could come into a relationship with God without needing to become Jews first. But you, we're going to see this pattern everywhere they go that there will also be people working against the gospel. So when Jewish people, and you, many of you will know this, I know, but when Jewish people of that era, when, when they would return back into the land of Israel, if they were traveling abroad, they take a trip and they come back into Israel, as they're coming back into the land of Israel, they would shake the dust off their feet. It was, it was a symbolic act. It was saying, you know, I don't want the contamination of Gentile lands to be upon me. And remember that in the Gospels, Jesus told his disciples to do the same thing. He said, if you go into a village 
and they don't receive you, you shake off the dust of your feet against them as a witness, saying that, okay, you're rejected, we're, we're done, and we're, we're treating you now as though you are Gentiles, really. So, so Jesus told his disciples to do the same when they were not received. Um, I, I have to draw this principle here from this passage and the other passages that many times it is wisest not to argue, right? Um, so many believers now are, are sucked into this thing because of social media that we just, we just have to argue. Like, why do we have to argue? Why do we have to take the bait? Why do we have to just keep it going, right? Um, many times it's wisest not to argue, but just to move on. Just trust God for the results, right? Uh, the Lord said, leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, right? He would say things like, he would say, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine. Now, that doesn't mean that anybody that doesn't listen to you is a swine, but you have to know when to disengage. You have to know when your conversation with someone is no longer productive, right? You have to know when the person you're talking to is not really interested in engaging with you. Does, does that make sense? Okay, I thought so. So, Many people did believe and the word of God was being spread. So now as the apostles moved on, they were going to need to entrust these new believers to God for the time being. They would come back and check on them in a little bit, but for the moment they were going to have to entrust them to the Lord. Um, very quickly, let's go to Galatia. We're doing a lot of walking here, tiring ourselves out. Verse 1 of chapter 14. Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude both of the Jews and of the Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord. Now, before they had a hard time, they left. This time they had a hard time and they stayed. Um, that just tells us that we, we have to, again, walk in close enough intimacy with the Holy Spirit that we can get a living word from him. What should I do, right? Remember the song, should I stay or should I go, right? I know some of you knew that back in the day. But, but we have to get that kind of a word from the Spirit. Then they stayed there a long time speaking boldly in the Lord who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding region, and they were preaching the gospel there. So once again, here's the pattern bringing the word to the Jews first, and many people believed, but again, the gospel has many adversaries. Um, the Lord was helping them, uh, as he often did by letting signs and wonders be done through them, but obviously you see the point is reached where they realize it's wiser to move on. Now there's a, a tremendous miracle story here that has uh, great significance. Verse 8, and in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. This man heard Paul speaking. Paul, observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates, intending to sacrifice with the multitude. So the garlands is the way that they would decorate these oxen, you know, with wreaths and flowers around their horns and their necks and whatever. So um, Paul discerns here by the Holy Spirit that the man has faith to be healed. You say, well, how does he do that? How does he know? We don't know. It's just, it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's discerning of spirits. He can tell that the man would respond in faith and be healed. You notice that this story is very similar to the story of the healing at the gate of the temple back in chapter 3. Now, it's, um, it's very interesting. The people in this region, um, how many of you, did they make you study Greek mythology? 
uh, in, in school. Do you remember that back in the day? I don't know if they do anymore, but we're showing our age if we say yes to that, I suppose. But the people of this region had a legend from Greek mythology. They believe that in this region long ago, the gods, Zeus and Hermes, so the Romans, it's Jupiter and Mercury, had come down to them in disguise. And they went from house to house looking for a place that would welcome them. And nobody welcomed them except this one little old couple. And they rewarded the little old couple by turning their house, you know, into a beautiful temple and making them a priest and priestess and basically wiped out everybody else. So that being the case, when these people saw this happen, and in this area was greatly devoted to Zeus and to Hermes. When these people saw this happen, we're like, okay, we don't want to miss out this time. <laughs> we don't want Zeus to wipe us out. So they perceived them as being Zeus and Mercury. Now, um, so what happens? Verse 14, now remember, they're speaking not in Greek. That's why Luke is giving you that detail. He wants you to know they're speaking in their own, whatever that native language is of Lyconia. And so Barnabas and Paul do not know what is happening until this happens. When the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and ran in among the multitude, crying out and saying, men, why are you doing these things? We also are men with the same nature as you. Now look, as any good Jews would do, uh, Barnabas and Paul are appalled that people would worship them. And so now you're going to see them making a presentation that is very different from the presentation that they make in the synagogue, right? Because you're talking to people who don't know anything uh, about divine revelation. Um, so look at how their message develops and they don't really get to probably complete the message where to the point where they would have wanted to take it. But we are also, we also are men with the same nature as you and preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them, who in bygone generations allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he did not leave himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, they could scarcely retain the, uh, restrain the multitudes from sacrificing to them. So that's the first example we have of the beginnings of a, of a presentation to people who are completely pagan. And you notice what they focus on. They focus on uh, the creation. They focus on the goodness of God in creation. And Paul probably would have led up a little deeper. We'll see him talking to some pagan philosophers later on in Athens. Verse 19, uh, then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there, and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. So, tantalizing story. It shows us how much opposition there can be, right, to the gospel, and also how quickly a crowd can turn how quickly opposition to the gospel can arise. You remember Jesus is coming in on Palm Sunday and he's being acclaimed with shouts of Hosanna and five days later, they're crucifying him. So um, look at the motivation and the depth of, of the hatred, the dislike for Paul and the message. Antioch is 100 miles away and these people walked all the way 100 miles to put a stop to what Paul was doing because they heard that Paul was there. He is stoned, and we don't know if he actually died or not. Uh, some Bible scholars believe that this is actually the occasion, which Paul tells the Corinthians about, when he uh, was taken up into the third heaven. So you might remember Paul said that he was taken up into the third heaven and he saw things up there that he's not allowed to talk about and so forth. So uh, it's possible that he was killed or he was about to die and he had this experience. We're not sure. Thankfully, he did get up. Uh, the Lord must have healed him because he get, ends up walking uh, with Barnabas because it's really the only way to travel when you don't have a horse, right? He's walking to Derby 60 miles. 
So the Lord must have really touched him. Look, if, if, if I even like, you know, twist my ankle, I don't want to even drive 60 miles. Forget get stoned and then walk to, you know, 60 miles away the next day. It's amazing. Verse 21, and when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. So notice the love and the care that they have here for the young believers. Here they just, they just got through getting not just criticized, but even attacked in these places. And yet, uh, like good shepherds, they went back to strengthen the people and help them grow in their faith on the way back. Part of that message, as you see, is telling them that it's through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. Um, you know, when Paul told Timothy that famous line when, when Paul said, everyone who wants to live godly in Jesus will be persecuted. You remember that? You know what he was talking about there? He was referencing the treatment to Timothy that he experienced in these places. So when Paul said that to Timothy, he was actually talking about these towns. Tribulations as part of the Christian life is not a message that we like to hear in our day, is it? But here's Paul and Barnabas believed that it was something we should teach to people at the very start of their Christian life. Jesus said that if we want to be his followers, we have to do what? We have to take up our crosses and follow him. So in verse 23, and thank you for bearing with me. I usually don't like to talk quite so long, but I, I did want to make sure we get this in. Uh, tonight. So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia. And when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From there, they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had completed. Now, when they'd come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So aside from encouraging the churches and really preparing them for the difficulties of the Christian life, they did something else that was very important, which was to appoint elders and set those elders in, install them in every church. And uh, apparently on their way back now, on their way back to Antioch in Syria, it seems that they did preach a little bit more in some new and additional places. So they come back to Antioch and they have the mother of all testimony meetings, right? They're reporting back to the church about all the wonderful things God has done. And it encourages the church because now the church is hearing that this mission field is wide open. God has opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And if we can just go into new areas, God's going to help us break even more areas open for the gospel of Jesus. And it says that they continue to minister there a long time. So what's going to happen now right after this is this controversy about whether you need to be circumcised and become a Jew in order to be a believer in Jesus, that did not go away. There was still a hardcore of people uh, who believe that you must be circumcised in order to be a follower of Jesus. And this group is going to get more powerful and more powerful. We're going to see uh, next time how everyone gets carried away with that idea. Even Peter, even Barnabas himself, and pretty much Paul is the last man standing there on Antioch who is going to stand for the gospel troop that the, that the gospel goes out to everyone and that everyone can be saved through faith in Jesus rather than keeping the law. So that's that's where we're headed. So next time we'll look at that. We'll also look a little bit at Galatians because we need we need what Paul says in there to understand Acts chapter 15 and what happened uh, as a result of that. So so that's what I have to share with you tonight. I am officially out of breath, but uh, we'll take um, we'll take questions if anybody if anybody has a question. We'll kick it off with Miss Marianne. I have a question. Um, was Paul later a tent maker, or was he always both a tent maker and a Pharisee? I'm not quite sure the chronology. Yeah, that's a good, um, that's a very good question. Um, I would suspect that that was, their, that was Paul's family business, because I don't, well, number one, because um, 
there wasn't a, there was a priestly class, but Paul was not a priest. They were, you know, they were Pharisees, so they were very religious, very devout. You could be a Pharisee out of any kind of occupation, right? It was more, now, the very religious ones probably had some occupations that they would not do, right? We talked about Peter staying in the house of Simon the Tanner, so they probably would not have gone into that kind of business because they would have had to handle dead animals and so forth to get their skin. But if you were just working with tents, working with, with canvas, uh, something like that, or making sheets for ships and things like that, so that probably would have been the kind of work he did. So I, I don't think it's something that you could go into easily later in life. Right, so kind of hard to take that up when you're 40. So I have a feeling that it was, that it was in his blood, although we don't we don't know for sure. So uh, he was, I think, by his own testimony, sent down to Jerusalem to learn to become a scholar as a kid. But seems like it was probably his family trade. Yeah. So somebody else, Mr. Noah. Okay, I was wondering if I was gonna my, gonna get my steps in tonight. Uh, it feels good to move. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor Nick. Um, do we know what happened to Elemis? And then the second part of that question is, is there any significance in him being called Bar-Jesus? Yeah, good. Um, we do not know what, what happened to him. And, um, you know, a lot of these people in church tradition, there's all kinds of crazy legends and stories that, that really spring up concerning them that we just you know, are silly and should just be disregarded because they're just legendary. Um, we don't know, you know, the name of G Jesus, Yeshua, is, was, was a very common name in, in that century. Um, it was probably one of the top ten names for boys uh, in, in that whole era uh, for Jews. And so it may not mean anything. Um, it may not mean like that he's trying to say he's the son of Jesus, but it may mean, because Yeshua can mean salvation. So it may mean that he's the son of salvation, that he has the ability to, to save and deliver people through demonic power. So there's a lot of different theories about what, what the name means. And that to me seems more likely than that he would be making some kind of imitation or impersonation about Jesus because the message of Jesus really hadn't penetrated that area yet. You know, later in the century, yes, but, but not at this time. So I think he's, he's maybe riffing on the word salvation and saying by that name that he has the power to save and help people through his sorcery, right? So, yeah, great question. Anybody else? Hello, Michael. Thank you for sharing that. Um, my question is, uh, when you said Paul was impeded with health issues, so it, uh, he couldn't travel as easily and readily. Later on, when he prays to God um, to take away the thorn in the flesh three times, and God says, my, my grace is sufficient, was he praying about that particular issue? Yeah, well, many people think that he was. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think that was the case. I mean, we can't know for sure, 100%. Uh, in the scripture, it's often the case that um, that symbolism of being a thorn in your flesh, or in the Old Testament, even thorn, it's thorns in your eyes, ouch, right? Um, that symbolism was used to talk about enemies that would constantly harass you and so forth. So some people say, okay, he was praying about a physical illness. Other people would say, well, no, he was actually praying um, about the fact that he could, he could hardly do anything <laughs> without being attacked and without being set upon. There were, there were seasons of grace later on in Acts, as we'll see, where the Lord did give him an open door and he was able in some places to have like a, a solid year and a half where he was able to teach and nobody bothered him. But that, but that was very rare, uh, especially when they were going into new areas. This, this was more of the pattern. They're, they're basically getting run out, uh, run out of, of one town and running into the other. So this, this may be part of the reason why um, 
we see this first um, Gentile convert by name other than Cornelius uh, in Sergius Paulus because um, one of the things that we think Luke is doing is trying to show Christianity as an acceptable form of belief that is not harmful to the empire and that Romans, that good Romans have approved of. Right? So when we read the Gospels, when we read Luke and when we read Acts, what do we see? We, you, you never see a bad story in the Gospels about a centurion. Right? Centurions are always good. I mean, centurion's like the classic, he's like the army sergeant. So it's a kind of an, almost an odd person to key on if, 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 you're, if you're a Jew. But if you're a Roman, right, you admire the centurion. He's everything a good Roman could be. So you hear you read this gospel about this Jesus and, oh, the centurion's good. He has faith. I haven't found such faith like this in all of Israel, Jesus says. Then Jesus is being crucified. And who's the one who says, surely this must have been the Son of God? Who says it? A centurion. Who's the first Gentile that receives the Holy Spirit and is saved? A centurion. So Luke is trying, I think, this is part of what he's doing. This is, this is almost like, in a way, a legal brief. Because now, here you have somebody who is a trusted, a governor of the island of Cyprus. And Luke says, he's an intelligent man. And he wants to hear these, these, these Jewish guys that are going through town, these Jewish philosophers. Who are they? What are they? I, I want to hear them. Make an appointment with them. And Luke says, he ends up believing. Now, you couldn't just make that up. You couldn't just make that up. And I, and I didn't dig into I didn't have time to completely dig into it, but I have read that there are records uh, of him and his family, Sergius Paulus, like being Christians, you know, for some time after this, you know, through successive generations or whatever, I think. So, you know, you can't just make up a story like that, especially when there's a lot of people still living who would know the truth if it, if it weren't true. So you will see Romans, uh, Roman officials treating them well um, and just b basically, if not approving of Christianity, saying, yeah, they're, they're okay. They're not dangerous radicals. They, they have something positive to bring to it. Um, because obviously the time that this is starting out, it's, it's hard for us to... Um, it's hard for us to imagine in today's world Christianity being in a place where, you know, maybe only one half of 1% of people in all the world are Christian. It's just too difficult for our mind to grab onto that. But that was the situation here, right? I mean, Jews are 10% of the empire, and of that 10%, there's a tiny slice who believe in Jesus. So it's important for Luke to say, look, here's a Roman guy who, you know, believed in Jesus. So, yeah, there's a, there's a, lot, a lot of layers there. So, boy, I really, that was, was that one rabbit trail or 10? I don't know. There was a lot of rabbit trails. Anybody else? No, we're good. Okay, we're all, we're all tired from walking from all of those cities to the next. So, well, let me, let me close this with a, with a word of prayer and, uh, and we'll head out. So, Lord, thank you for this. Lord, there's, there's just so much in here. Help us to, to meditate on it. Lord, help us to remember, um, Lord, that it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. So help us to just shake off any modern views that, that have lied to us that tell us that the Christian life is supposed to be just an easy uh, cakewalk, Lord. And uh, help us to have a steadfastness of heart that is determined to bring your word to people who don't know you, Lord. And help us to also have that spirit of Barnabas, Lord, who, who never complained as he saw his brother Paul becoming more prominent and surpassing him in, in prominence and in, even in people's affection, Lord. And God, I pray that we would also have such care for the sheep, Lord. We are, we're so impressed to see how these men, after the beatings and, and so forth that they endured, that they deliberately went back over the same ground to check on the saints. And so help us to have a heart to love and encourage and build up one another in the faith like that, Lord. And we just thank you for this time together in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless everybody.